Welcome to today's Healthline webinar from the American Association of Kidney Patients, titled Stop the Itch, Understanding and Managing Chronic Kidney Disease Associated Paritis, or CKDAP. Thank you for joining us. My name is Jerome Bailey, and I am AAKP's Director of Patient Engagement and Advocacy. AAKP thanks CSL VIFOR for providing an educational donation for this educational webinar. AAKP Healthline webinars fall under our Center for Patient Research and Education. We believe patient and care partner education is an integral part of treatment and protection of patient lives, and we work to ensure that the patient has a central role in research and guidance that are designed to determine optimal approaches and strategies for providing healthcare services, assistance program, and access to new products and services. We built this center with the latest polling and engagement technologies to ensure that kidney patients take a central role in informing the federal, academic, and private sector research shaping the next generation of healthcare services, assistance programs, and innovative new treatments. We encourage you to respond to our flash surveys and other engagement opportunities that you receive via email as an AAKP member. As the oldest and largest independent patient-led kidney patient organization in the US, AAKP is proud to host this webinar as a service to our fellow kidney patients, family members, and care partners healthcare professionals, researchers, and policymakers. AAKP is a champion for full patient choice, the protection of patient-doctor relationships, and the elimination of barriers for patient access to available treatment options. Today's program is very exciting as it features a discussion about understanding and managing CKDAP. CKDAP is often a distressing and overlooked condition found primarily in people treated with hemodialysis. It too often goes undiagnosed or misdiagnosed by healthcare providers. Our speakers today will discuss how CKDAP is assessed and managed, measured, why it is often misdiagnosed, what does it look like, and treatment options. We also have two AAKP ambassadors who will share their experience with the condition. Now, without further ado, let's get started. It's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker for today's webinar, Dr. Angelo Caraboyas. Dr. Caraboyas is a trained epidemiologist and biostatistician at Arbor Research Collaborative for Health, who has provided support for the International Dialysis Outcomes and Practice Pattern Study for over 10 years, focusing on identifying best practices and dialysis you know, using innovative study designs and statistical methods. Dr. Kara Boyas has co-authored over 60 original publications in peer-reviewed journals, including several focus on patient reported outcomes and CKDAP. Welcome Dr. Kara Boyas. I'll turn things over to you. Thanks, Jerome. Um, so I, I am Angelo Kara Boyas. Uh, I'm a research scientist at Arbor Research. And I wanted to talk today about uh, chronic kidney disease associated paritis. I, my role is typically to uh, work with kidney doctors to help identify best treatments and practices uh, in dialysis. And that often includes patient reported outcomes such as chronic kidney disease associated paritis. Before I get into the research, I, I wanted to first uh, acknowledge and thank the funders for the Dialysis Outcomes and Practice Pattern Study, or the uh, DOPS, uh, as we like to call it. The DOPS is a very large cohort study. Uh, we are in over 20 countries, and we have enrolled uh, over 100,000 patients that include those on hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis, uh, as well as non-dialysis uh, chronic kidney disease. Uh, the study's been ongoing since 1996, and we are currently the largest international study of uh, chronic kidney disease-associated paritis. So what is chronic kidney disease-associated paritis? So I will first refer you to the aakp.org website, uh, give them a plug. And as, as the website defines it, 
CKDAP is moderate to severe itching that is directly related to kidney disease. Uh, so this is uh, unrelated to uh, itch that may be caused by other comorbid conditions such as liver or skin disease. Those with more advanced CKD or on dialysis are at the greatest risk. And CKDAP can be difficult to diagnose for a couple reasons. One is that severity uh, may vary over time. Uh, some patients may be mildly or moderately or severely bothered at different time points. Um, and, and itch may occur randomly uh, or frequently. How can we assess CKDAP? Well, the, the easy answer is to ask the patient. There are numerous itch surveys out there. Uh, in DOPS, we, we typically use a question that is included on the KDQOL 36 survey. You can tell by the name, it includes 36 questions about just, uh, general quality of life and, um, and related measures. But there's one question in particular on this instrument uh, that asks patients, to what extent have you been bothered by itchy skin over the past four weeks? And gives you response answers ranging from, from not at all bothered all the way through extremely bothered. Here is what the data tell us for this question. And you can see from, ranging from the, the left side to the right side, uh, we show data from uh, non-dialysis CKD stage three, four, five, and then on the far right side patients on hemodialysis. If you focus first on the, the top of this graph, the, the dark green, uh, this, is, this is where you want to be. This is uh, patients that, that said they were not at all bothered by itching. Um, and in non-dialysis CKD, the proportion of patients ranged from say 40 to 45%, so a little less than half the patients, so they were not at all bothered. But when we look at hemodialysis, that number drops to 18%, uh, so which implies over 80%, four out of five patients are at least somewhat bothered by itchy skin. If we switch gears and, and look at the bottom of this graph, the yellow, orange, and red, we can add up the proportions who were at least moderately bothered by itchy skin. And you can see this ranges for non-dialysis patients from 25 to 30%, and then jumps up near 40% for those on hemodialysis. So that's what you see if you ask patients. What if you also ask uh, medical directors at dialysis centers? Um, and so our, we have another survey in DOPS, which uh, surveys the medical directors. We ask them to estimate what percent of dialysis patients in your center uh, had severe pruritus. Um, and you can see in the, the, the overwhelming majority there in the green responded and said, probably less than 5% of, of our patients are uh, bothered by severe pruritus. And you can see a, a real disconnect there um, versus the prior slide where we saw close to 20% of patients uh, reported being very much or extremely bothered by itch. We also have investigated uh, health outcomes that are associated with uh, severe CKDAP. I have uh, done research with Dr. Sukul, who you'll hear from later in this session uh, to, to try to better understand um, health outcomes for patients bothered by itch. And we have consistently found that those more bothered by itch had worse outcomes. Those outcomes range from clinical outcomes, uh, higher rates of mortality and hospitalization, which include cardiovascular events uh, and infection, particularly skin infection, also dialysis-related outcomes, Patients bothered by itch were more, more likely to skip their dialysis session and took a longer time to recover from their dialysis session. We also found poor patient reported outcomes. Uh, these are measures of quality of life, uh, depressive symptoms, sleep quality. Uh, and we, we also found patients more bothered by itch uh, had worse outcomes in this regard. And the common theme among these was patients that were moderately or very much bothered had slightly worse outcomes, but those extremely bothered by itch uh, had by far the worst outcomes across the board. How consistent is itching if you ask patients, say, from one year to the next? Uh, on the right side here, uh, th this shows what happens when we administer our annual survey. We ask patients in one year and then 
We follow back up one year later and ask them the same question. Uh, to what extent are you bothered by itchy skin? And 44% of patients have provided the same response, um, which means over half to actually changed their answer from the prior year. Um, so 28% are now doing better, but also 28% are now doing worse. On the far left side of the graph focuses on patients who, uh, in the initial questionnaire, responded that they were not at all bothered by itching. If we focus on this group, we followed up with them one year later and found that 42% of them uh, now did report that they were at least somewhat bothered by itching. If we look at patients who were very much or extremely bothered by itching on our initial questionnaire, we followed up with them one year later, uh, the good news is that around 60% of those patients did report some improvement uh, in their itch symptoms um, from the past year. We found if we asked the patient at the same time point um, about their itch, about other measure, measures such as sleep quality, uh, we did find a correlation. We also wanted to know if, if itch changes, if patient's itch is getting better or getting worse, um, does does that have an impact on sleep quality? Does sleep quality also change? And so what we first did was we looked at patients who were not bothered by itch at that first year assessment um, and found that about 25 or 30 percent of them reported having poor sleep quality. Now when we fast forward one year later and followed up with them, we asked again about their itch and about sleep quality. Here we found that if the patient uh, then reported itch uh, at the second questionnaire, they were much more likely uh, to report uh, poor sleep quality. You can see the red arrow up close to 50% there, uh, whereas the patients who were still not bothered by itch, uh, they, their sleep quality remained largely uh, unchanged. We, we see the same phenomenon if we focus on patients who were bothered by itch in uh, year one. If we isolate those patients who were still bothered by itch at the second questionnaire, their sleep quality was similarly poor. Over half were uh, reported poor sleep quality. For among those patients whose itch improved from year one to year two, we saw their sleep quality uh, also improve. We show results here for, for sleep quality. We looked at this uh, similar analysis for quality of life, for uh, depression, and other related measures and really found that the story uh, was the same, that a lot of these patient reported outcomes uh, changed uh, along with the patient's uh, pruritus symptoms. To summarize, when, when patients are asked about their itch, in the non-dialysis setting, about 25 to 30% uh, reported being at least moderately bothered by itch. And in the dialysis setting, it was closer to 40%. In contrast, when we asked medical directors at dialysis centers, uh, most of them estimated that uh, proportion of patients with severe pruritus was actually less than 5%. CKDAP, uh, we found, has been associated with a variety of poor outcomes, including cardiovascular events, infection, and worse quality of life. And when, when measured more than once, we found that CKDAP can be highly variable. Uh, over half of the patients responded differently about their itch severity uh, from one year to the next and found that sleep quality, depression, and overall quality of life uh, all trended positively uh, when itch symptoms improved. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Caraboyas. We appreciate that presentation. We'll come back to you during the question and answer period of the webinar. We'll now turn the presentation to one of our AAKP ambassadors, Fiona McKinney, is an in-center hemodialysis patient in New York. She is a Reiki master and registered polarity therapy practitioner. Originally from Ireland, Ms. McKinney was diagnosed with glomerular nephritis when she was 16 years old and moved to New York City in the late 1980s to seek alternative healing methods. Uh, that supported her, her, her health and for over 20 years. In April 2008, she started dialysis. She is currently director and community outreach manager, manager of several marathon charity programs with Achilles International, an activities-based nonprofit for children and adults with various disabilities. 
Ms. McKinney joins us to share her story. I'll turn things over to you. Thank you so much, Jerome, and uh, thank you so much, Dr. Angelo, for a wonderful presentation. Um, so I only recently discovered that um, the itching that I was getting on dialysis um, related to being on dialysis. Uh, at the beginning, so I've been on dialysis 15 years, and at the beginning I was told it related to high levels of phosphorus. So that didn't make sense to me because my levels, uh, phosphorus levels have always been, you know, within the, the right uh, frame and levels. So it wasn't that. And um, interestingly enough, it was only a few months ago when AAKP had sent around an email asking, you know, addressing the issue and asking patients if they were dealing with this. And I responded and filled out a survey. It was only at that point I realized that um, it is something that's real and I wasn't the only one dealing with it. Uh, it was also, I had noticed a couple of patients in my in-center clinic had been scratching a lot. One particular woman had actual, um, one of those long, you know, a device anyway to scratch her back during dialysis. And I'd asked about that because I, then became aware that, um, as I say, it wasn't just me having these uh, symptoms. The thing that bothered me the most was when I started getting what I thought was adult acne on my face, and I had never experienced that before. I assumed it had to do with, um, you know, not getting rid of toxins completely during the dialysis treatments. And I went to see a dermatologist. He gave me cream to um, ease the inflammation on my skin and the itching and then the resulting um, scars that I was getting on, on my face because they were more visible than other parts of my body. I was far more self-conscious about that. I uh, didn't address the itching in the rest of my body for a very long time. It was only quite recently I spoke to my nephrologist about it and uh, he suggested at that point just to make sure my skin is not dry to use um, creams and lotions on, you know, on my skin. So I have been trying that. I, it's too soon to know if it'll work. But um, in terms of um, how bad it had been from the beginning and up to this point, definitely has been much worse recently. Again, I'm on dialysis 15 years. So that might have something to do with it. And um, it does, I find it actually affected me quite emotionally and personally because I have a number of scars on my arms and my legs and I then get very conscious about that, especially in the summertime. I'm based in New York, so it's very warm in the summer in New York. And I generally end up wearing long sleeved um, clothes during the, the summer months. Um, I'm trying to think of anything else I, I might add to that. Um, I think that's it. Are there any questions, Jerome, I could possibly answer? Uh, sure. Uh, we do have a, a, a few questions that came in during um, prior uh, to the start of our webinar today, but I have had one for you. Um, did you, do you feel better, uh, less itchy when your dialysis session is over? Yeah, very good question. Thank you. Definitely. It's, uh, now, I still do get a bit itching outside of dialysis, but it's absolutely related to being on dialysis. In fact, it's been quite bad recently, and I've been exploring the possibility of being um, of getting Benadryl during my treatments. That apparently is something that might help, but it definitely uh, is much worse during dialysis. Thank you, Fiona. Uh, we appreciate you sharing your perspective. And again, we, ha we have some questions that came in from um, our audience and we'll get to those shortly. We have more information coming your way with our next speaker. Dr. Nidhi Sukul is a clinical assistant professor with a specialty in nephrology at the University of Michigan Health. She completed her medical training at the University of Toledo College of Medicine. She's done extensive research related to CKDAP. We are happy to have her join us to share some of her findings. Welcome, Dr. Sukul. 
I'll turn the presentation over to you. Thank you very much, Jerome. Hi, everyone. My name is Nidhi Sukal, and as Jerome mentioned, I am one of the nephrologists here in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I am a practicing general nephrologist. I see patients on hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis, and also take care of patients with chronic kidney disease who are not yet on dialysis. I'm very happy to be here today to talk about kidney itch, going over the assessment, pathophysiology, and treatments. CKD-AP, also known as kidney itch, is subjective. It adds a layer of difficulty in diagnosing it, not to mention that there is actually no standardized way to measure it. Overall, scales and questionnaires have been the most common way of assessing and measuring CKD-AP. Here you can see the visual analog scale where patients point on this visual scale, the severity of their itch, and then you see the verbal rating scale and then the numerical rating scale, which are all basically versions of each other. As was mentioned previously in this presentation, the use of the single question is taken from the Kidney Disease Quality of Life 36 questionnaire which asks the patients in the preceding four weeks, how bothered were you by itching? With response options, including not at all, somewhat, moderately, very much, or extremely. And it is this question that forms the basis of much of the research that has been done recently on CKD AP. In general, pruritus is typically underreported. In a 2017 study in the international DOPS population, it was found that 17% of patients who were nearly always or always bothered by itchy skin had not reported their symptoms to any healthcare provider. And this was up to 33% in the United States. This underreporting leads to an underestimation of pruritus prevalence. In the same study, medical directors underestimated the prevalence of pruritus in nearly 70% of facilities. And in facilities where 21 to 50% of patients reported having severe pruritus, only 1% of medical directors estimated this prevalence correctly. This lack of awareness, no doubt, represents a failure of communication. Affected individuals may not be reporting it, and clinicians are not asking. Many people are simply unaware that itching is related to kidney disease, and so do not think it relevant to discuss. In a 2009 German study of questionnaires given to about 200 nephrologists, the figure on the left here demonstrates on the top bar that more than one third estimated the prevalence of pruritus as between one and 10%, which is much less than the prevalence shown earlier in this presentation, as well as in the majority of studies conducted. And when asked if there was an association between pruritus and dialysis, more than two thirds of nephrologists said no. This emphasizes the fact that nephrologists are under-recognizing this issue and underscores the general lack of knowledge of CKD AP. The 2017 DOP study showed that 18% of patients who were nearly always or always bothered had not taken any treatment for it. And the 2019 CK DOP study focused on patients with chronic kidney disease not yet on dialysis showed that less than 10% of affected patients were on commonly prescribed medications for pruritus. A 2013 study looked at perceived barriers to symptom management, which demonstrated that healthcare providers did not feel it was their role to treat these symptoms, believing that management should be limited to dialysis-related issues. And if it is not recognized that pruritus is related to dialysis, or rather end-stage kidney disease, then it will likely continue to go unaddressed. This 2013 study also identified the consensus that symptom management in dialysis patients is overall challenging, citing that some symptoms were unavoidable and that patients understandably don't often want to lengthen their treatment, which is a common suggestion to help treat pruritus. It is true that there has not been a discovery to prevent pruritus at this time, and the thought that more dialysis will help pruritus is not always necessarily the case. There is a previously held belief that tight control of phosphorus and PTH levels will help. It was indeed initially felt to be the case, but this was usually in the setting of extreme levels, and more recent studies have not demonstrated this association for levels just mildly above normal. So what does CKD AP actually look like? The areas of the skin that are typically affected are large, 
bilateral, and usually symmetrical. It can be generalized or, when localized, commonly affects the back, face, chest, and arms. And it doesn't have to affect the same spot every time. The affected area can certainly change and move from week to week. One third of patients are affected at night and severity is often worse at night as well. There is typically little association with the timing of dialysis and CKD AP is often accompanied by dry skin, otherwise known as xerosis. And in fact, nearly 70% of people treated with hemodialysis who are moderately bothered by itching and 87% who are extremely bothered by itching are also bothered by dry skin. Unfortunately, chronic scratching can lead to skin changes, such as scabs and crusts, local infection, ulceration, and nodules with eventual scarring. The pathology of kidney itch is admittedly complex and unfortunately, incompletely understood. Based on the existing literature, there are a few unique pathophysiologic mechanisms of itch generation in CKD AP. One important mechanism is peripheral neuropathy. Given that a high prevalence of peripheral sensory motor neuropathy and dysautonomia has been found in dialysis patients, which may explain their itching. Dialysis patients with paresthesia and restless leg syndrome are more frequently found to have CKD AP. Another mechanism that is implicated is microinflammation in the skin and possibly systemic inflammation as well, which may stimulate itching. This is especially given so that higher levels of inflammatory cells and inflammatory markers have been seen in these patients in recent studies. Finally, opioid imbalance is another important consideration given that neuronal circuits that transmit pain and itch sensations overlap considerably and opioids are also known to cause itching as a side effect. The theory here is that overstimulation of central mu opioid receptors located in the central nervous system or antagonism of peripheral kappa opioid receptors or an imbalance between the two causes itching. What are our options? Since xerosis or dry skin occurs in up to 85% of dialysis patients, likely contributing to pruritus severity, and trials of emollient creams have decreased itching, emollient creams are typically recommended as first-line baseline therapy for all patients with pruritus, especially given its low risk of side effects. In the 2015 DOP study, antihistamines were most commonly used in all countries, that is, among patients who were not referred to a skin specialist. And overall, 57% of medical directors used oral antihistamines as first-line therapy, though common clinical experience have shown them to be largely ineffective. Now, furifine targets the opioid pathophysiologic mechanism as a peripheral kappa opioid receptor agonist, but is currently only approved for use in Japan. Next, the 2020 Cochrane Review which is the most rigorous and comprehensive review of treatments for kidney itch, showed that gabapentin and pregabalin were the most studied drugs and showed the greatest reduction in itch scores. It is suggested to start at a low dose and then increase either weekly or every two weeks until they see symptom control. However, gabapentin can often be limited by its side effects, which are usually dizziness or drowsiness, at which time pregabalin can be tried, though pregabalin also causes dizziness and drowsiness, though not as often or as severe, but it is usually more expensive. Difelakephalin is a newer, recently FDA-approved peripheral kappa opioid receptor agonist, meant to be administered intravenously with dialysis treatments, and studies show that it reduced its score more than placebo with improved quality of life. Side effects were mild, perhaps because it does not act on the central nervous system, and included dizziness, diarrhea, and vomiting as the most commonly occurring side effects. Availability, however, will vary per facility depending upon what is on the formulary medication list, as will the experience of the nephrologist regarding their comfort in treatment.
Other therapies include ultraviolet B light therapy, which is thought to address the inflammatory causes of pruritus by inhibiting T helper immune response and alter interleukin production, which are other inflammatory cells. Lastly, transplantation has been shown to significantly improve and help CKDAP, though as one can imagine, this is unfortunately not a readily available treatment for most people. Lastly, I wanted to introduce Facts Facts Kidney Itch, which is a handbook that I have co-authored and my co-author, Dr. Rayner, has a podcast by the same name that addresses the fact that as we've discussed here today, kidney itch is common, but often undiagnosed. And even when it is recognized, it is typically inadequately treated or not treated at all. In it, we describe the problem of kidney itch in detail, document the impact it has on people's lives, review the current understanding of its pathophysiology, and set out an evidence-based approach to its assessment and management. I wanna thank you very much for, you, for having me here today to talk with you all about this very important topic. Thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Sokol, for sharing this presentation. I'm sure um, we'll be back with you shortly uh, for the question and answer period of the presentation. Our last speaker is an AAKP ambassador who will share her experience managing CKD AP. Christine Hernandez is a home hemodialysis patient in Illinois. She has dedicated her life to helping others and has been a registered nurse for over 10 years. In 2016, she found out she had a genetic kidney disease that also affected several members of her family. Ms. Hernandez wants to help make a difference in the lives of others by using, using her experience as a nurse and as a kidney warrior. We welcome Ms. Hernandez to the call to share her experience with CKD AP. Welcome. Uh, hi, good afternoon. Thank you, Jerome. Um, so I, I, I've been on dialysis, it's going on four years now, and I uh, never had like an itching problem, but July of uh, last year, um, all of a sudden I started feeling this itch. It was so intense that I, I like was scratching everywhere and, and my head was itching, my feet were itching. Um, I told the nurse, I said, hey, uh, I'm like itching really bad. Can I have a Benadryl? I used to have to fight. And you know, the first two times I got insulted and they brought me a Zyrtec. I said, I'm trying to take my blood out of my body with scratches and you're gonna bring me a Zyrtec? I need like a Benadryl, you know, I, I'm, I'm outspoken. So I'm going to ask for what I want and I know what's going to help me because I knew the itch was that bad. Anyway, I, uh, I actually called my doctor cause he wasn't there and he said, give Christine a Benadryl please. So they gave me Benadryl and the Benadryl didn't help me. And, um, at that point I stood, uh, like maybe cause I was four hours on the machine and this started like the second hour in, I told him, I don't know if I'm going to be able to stay uh, in this chair because I I'm itching. Uh, even my back is itching and I can't stop itching and expecting me to stay here on dialysis and not being able to scratch myself or do something is like almost inhuman. You know, so I basically, um, got off of dialysis. So, uh, the next day I had to go back to dialysis. Uh, I asked, can I get a Benadryl before I start to see if it'll help with the itch because I have, I'm scared it's going to come back. Then I'm not going to be able to finish dialysis. And they gave me the Benadryl and, uh, it calmed me down because it put me to sleep. But then I woke up like almost a third hour in and I started itching again. And I said, I'm starting to itch again. This is just terrible. I don't know what to do. Uh, it was really bad. Like if you had a scale from one to 10, 10 being the worst itch, it was 11, you know? And, um, I told them, uh, we got to do something about this itch because, uh, 
I can't keep doing this. So we did this for maybe like two weeks and I had to shorten dialysis a few times because I had to come home. I had to take a shower because it, I felt like I needed a shower and the shower didn't help because it was the itch was coming from inside and I couldn't scratch it. Um, I, I stood like that a few weeks and then uh, my doctor uh, came to me and he says, hey, Christine, we're, we're going to try this medication. It's called Corsuva and see it's an IV medicine. It's a new medicine and it might help you uh, with the itch. So uh, he says it doesn't work fast, but after a few doses, a few sessions, you'll start feeling better. We'll give you the Benadryl and we'll give you the Corsuva as well. So anyway, I dealt with the itch uh, for a few weeks as they started the Corsuva therapy and actually it started working. But then after uh, a few weeks, it came back again, you know, like it was working for a while and then it started itching again. And it's the worst feeling to have an itch, not be able to scratch it, make uh, cuts all over your arms, your legs, your head, your face, your neck, and um, uh, not be able to take it away. I would put alcohol on my body, didn't help. Um, I told them that they should like screen everybody for itch because I'm pretty sure I wasn't the only one itching and a few other people started getting on the medicine that I was on. Now I'm at home and I have to take Benadryl because they don't do it for home hemo. It hasn't been approved like to for me to inf put it in the infusion. So I'm, I'm dealing with it again. So, uh, Christine, uh, you know, is the itch less now that you've moved to a home therapy? Yes, it, it is less, uh, uh, a lot less compared to when I was in center. And I asked them, I said, can I ask you a question? Because I didn't have a problem till now. My phosphorus levels are just fine. Um, did you guys change something in the formulation of, you know, the dialysate or did something happen to make me have this reaction in my body to dialysis? Like I wasn't allergic to dialysis before and I feel like now I'm having allergies when I start dialysis, like what changed? I haven't gotten an answer, but I feel like something changed. I, I don't know. And um, I didn't change anything in my body. I didn't change anything in my laundry detergent, but I felt like something changed. Thank you, Ms. Hernandez, for sharing your story. Uh, we have a few questions that people submitted when they registered for the webinar um, that I'm hoping our uh, panel can address. Uh, we're gonna start with the question for Dr. Sukul. Uh, the question is, as a social worker on the IDT team, uh, how can we help guide our patients with this problem? That's an excellent question, and I'm so happy to hear that this really is kind of an interdisciplinary issue. Um, you know, oftentimes our nephrologists are not asking, and the patients also may not know that it's something to ask about, or they perhaps may feel shy to ask about it. They know that the time with the physician, you know, they have so many patients to see, they may not, you know, want to bring it up or have other things to talk about. The idea here is that, you know, our social workers, especially in the unit that I'm in, always develop this wonderful rapport with the patients and make time to really talk with them and hear them out. And for them to be a, a real good social or a source of support, I should say, where they can ask, they can also ask about itching, does not necessarily have to be the clinician um, specifically, but that they can ask about the itching and then say they get started on some type of treatment, they can help follow up and see if the treatment is working, is the itch gone or just improved. And I imagine that as patients feel more and more comfortable with whoever they're talking with or talking, or talking about as far as the itching goes, they may be more apt to open up and talk about it in more detail, which will also allow for better treatment of it as well. So I think I'm so happy to hear this question because I think um, social work probably has a, a very important role in this interdisciplinary, um, in the interdisciplinary team in general, but also in this interdisciplinary um, issue as well. Thank you for that. Uh, and uh, I kind of going to pose the same question uh, to Christine. Uh, we have several providers on the webinar today. 
what advice would you give them if a patient was to share with them that they are suffering from severe itching? Um, I would say, um, take it, uh, uh, it's really serious, uh, because it's affecting the quality of life and, uh, they, uh, it might even affect their dialysis, dialysis sessions. Like it affected mine. So, uh, treat it, uh, and get on top of it faster, uh, because, um, it, it it's just, uh, not a good feeling. Uh, this other question is for Fiona. Uh, what advice would you give another patient who is suffering from itching? Um, um, to talk about it, I think, uh, first of all, this is an absolutely wonderful uh, webinar. I haven't received as much information in my 15 years on dialysis as I've received on this uh, presentation. I think it's been wonderful. I would definitely recommend that patient, first of all, talk to their care team in center, if they're in dialysis center, talk to their doctor. Again, what's come up today, and I experienced it personally, it's not always taken seriously. Uh, so that'd be the first thing for um, the, the medical team that the patient is working with to make sure they are taking uh, the patient seriously. And um, I also think to branch out and make sure the patient connects with other patients and experts through AAKP and other great support organizations like that, because it's through um, AAKP and other uh, organizations similar that uh, we get our best information about our own health and can advocate for ourselves in this way and talk to other patients and find the best resources for what our needs are. Um, that's what certainly has been helping me. About uh, patient, that patient to patient connection and how it's uh, helpful to um, uh, uh, not only patients, but their family members. Uh, Dr. Suko, uh, how can one tell if the itching is related to kidney disease or another source? It's a great question um, and definitely adds a little bit to the complexity of diagnosing it. So CKD AP is truly a diagnosis of exclusion. You really, you have, there's nothing specific that diagnoses it in particular, but really what you need to do is kind of go through these other possibilities, rule those out. And then if there's not another um, kind of obvious explanation, then treat it as CKD AP. And so, you know, the other kind of diagnoses that have been implicated in, in itching in general, of course, we had, I think was touched on earlier in the presentation are things like liver disease, skin disease. So in the absence of liver disease, in the absence of other kind of skin diagnoses, um, you know, in the absence of other symptoms that might make you think of a more systemic allergic response with the itchy eyes, yeah, seasonal allergies, things like that, um, if nothing else is kind of popping out as a possibility, should focus on the possibility of CKD AP. And if symptoms are pretty severe and you can ask about sleep disturbance, you can ask them, you know, how severe is it really on that scale of one to 10 and any answer, you know, really above seven, um, if it's affecting their quality of life, I, I don't think people should hesitate in kind of, in addition to emollient creams, really going to that systemic therapy um, to try and help these patients because as you all have heard, it really takes such a toll on patients and not only affects them and their quality of life, but other manifestations such as their dialysis. And when they don't get adequate dialysis, a lot of other things can become affected. So it really is kind of a, a cascade of, um, really a cascade of manifestations of this, of this itch. So overall, a diagnosis of exclusion, take a look at other kind of comorbid diagnoses. And if there's no other obvious cause, I would focus on it being CKDAP. Yeah. Another question for you, Dr. Sukal. Uh, is this condition seen just in adults or can pediatric hemodialysis patients get it as well? It's a great question. Most of my research is on adult patients, but it can happen in children as well. There was a small study in 2016 of just about 100 uh, pediatric patients. 
And they found the prevalence there is about 20%. And so I don't want people to think that this is just kind of an adult only thing. Children absolutely can be affected. And so it's just as important to ask them as it is adults. It looks like the prevalence may be a little bit less, but I don't think that that should stop clinicians from asking about it, assessing patients and making sure that if they are having the symptom that it is getting addressed. Thank you. Uh, another question for you, Dr. Zuko. Uh, is it possible to have itching post-transplant? Good question. So post-transplant um, is known to very much improve CKDAP and pretty much cure it, but I wouldn't say that that's probably the case for everyone. I think, you know, in most cases it, it can cure it, but it is possible to have itching post-transplant. Usually it's not as prevalent and it is not as severe. And there has been some suggestion that post-transplant kidney function itself can be tied or associated with the possibility of pruritus. So I would say it is still, um, it is still people, patients should still not necessarily expect to have pruritus after transplant, though it is still possible. Uh, and one more question for you, Dr. Zuko. Uh, do different foods affect itching? I'm so glad you asked that. I think, you know, a lot of, and we kind of alluded to this also um, in this presentation that, you know, foods that are high in phosphorus, we commonly advise patients to limit the foods high in phosphorus because phosphorus has been implicated in pruritus for, for years. Um, but I would say directly, no, no foods that I know of are directly associated with itching. Now, if patients have some allergic response to certain foods and things like that, then then certain foods can be directly related to itching, but not in the realm necessarily of CKDAP. So in the absence of food allergies, um, there's no kind of association directly of food with CKDAP. Um, there are other reasons to control your phosphorus. So even though even mildly elevated levels should not necessarily be, the, be solely responsible for a person's pruritus, there are definitely other health benefits of keeping your phosphorus under good control. But just kind of um, as our ambassadors have alluded to as well, um, you know, phosphorus doesn't really have a lot to do with pruritus in, in the way that it was previously thought in, in research kind of years ago, um, where maybe extreme levels were looked at, but recently, um, in recent studies, mildly elevated levels haven't really shown that same association. So um, to directly answer your question, no, there's no foods that are directly related to CKDAP, though it is still a good idea to keep good control of phosphorus for other reasons. Thank you, thank you. We have uh, one last question and I'm gonna um, ask uh, Fiona to, uh, to answer this one. Uh, what would you tell someone who is experiencing itching while on dialysis and their nurse or their doctor is brushing them off. Do you have any suggestions on how someone can advocate for themselves? Hey, thanks, Jerome, that's a wonderful question. And um, I actually went through that very recently myself, as, as Christine mentioned, um, I was brushed off by a nurse that I didn't really know. And she asked me if um, using a different laundry detergent and. There was th that wasn't the issue. Like Christine, I actually asked if the any of the formulas had changed on the dialysis treatment, and um, I don't think that is the issue. So I would definitely, um, you know, be an advocate for yourself. Again, going back to what Christine said, not to um, to fight for what you believe um, is going on, and not to allow you the staff or anybody to brush you off. Again, I think um, the best thing to do is to join an organization like AAKP and talk to other patients. And with that support, uh, you know, group support, I think is very, very helpful. And um, the social workers, social workers is certainly in my clinic as well are wonderful. And I think they're a great advocate for what uh, patients are going through as well. So I hope those things would help. Thank you, Ms. Fiona McKinney, Mc, McKinney and Ms. Christine Hernandez, as well as Drs. Karaboyas and Dr. Nidi Sukol. Uh, your presentations were very informative.
If anyone watching has any additional questions for our speakers or about today's webinar that we were unable to get to, please send those questions to info at aakp.org, noting the webinar title and the email subject line. I'd like to close today's webinar with a few slides on additional resources that may be of interest to you. If you are not already a member of AAKP, we encourage you to join. AAKP offers free membership to patients and their family members, as well as living kidney donors. To become a free member, join online at aakp.org or by phone at 1-800-749-2257. To receive all the benefits of membership, please be sure to include your email address when signing up. As an AAKP member, you will be notified by email when opportunities arise where your opinions and experiences are needed to help inform innovation, advance care, and make a meaningful impact to improve lives. We encourage you to respond to our flash surveys and other engagement opportunities to help us elevate the patient voice and change the status quo for kidney disease care. You can also select to receive any of our five different electronic newsletters and subscribe to our printed magazine, AAKP Renal Life. We also invite you to follow us on our blog and social media for all the latest news and announcements. AAKP is dedicated to helping kidney patients across the disease spectrum understand their condition and, can take, and take control of their health care. We are proud to offer a variety of resources for both patients and care partners by visiting our website at aakp.org and clicking on the AAKP store at, um, on the AAK, AAKP store button at the top of the homepage. You can find a variety of educational brochures and online tools to order or download, including our pocket guide to managing CKD AP or the Stop the Itch toolkit. We also have articles on CKD AP that we encourage you to read as well as patient profile articles that you may find helpful. You can also order materials by phone. We are excited to announce the dates of our 2023 events, the fifth annual global summit on kidney disease innovations in partnership with George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences will be a hybrid event both online and in person in Washington, DC, and will take place June 28th and 29th. The sixth annual policy summit will take place virtually on July 28th. The 48th annual national patient meeting will take place virtually September 22nd, September 20th through the 22nd. And the fifth annual AAKP fun walk will take place virtually December 4th through 8th with an in-person walk in Tampa, Florida on December 9th. We invite you to let us know which events you are interested participating in this year, and we'll be sure to notify you when registration is open. You can also visit our YouTube channel to watch presentations on demand from our 2022 events and programs. As we close, we'd again like to thank CSL VIFOR for, for providing an education, educational donation for this Healthline webinar. And thank you, Dr. Karaboyas, uh, Ms. Fiona McKinley, Dr. Nadi Suku, and Ms. Christine Hernandez for participating in today's AAKP Healthline webinar. Thank you all for joining us today.